family uh, through these last several years on social media and various places. But thankful that he's with us. He's going to be teaching just in our life group hour uh, today, and he's going to be ministering music all week long with Brother Dwight. So give him your attention as he comes and teaches and preaches for us this morning. Thank you, Brother Josh. That'll be 10 demerits for you, sir. For uh, to, <laughs> But it, it, was, it, was a, it was a privilege, it was a joy to, to get to know Brother Josh a little bit. One thing I always remember about you, Brother Josh, is he always had the snazziest socks. You know, the socks were always just, mm, you know what I mean? So I, I haven't checked the socks today, but I'm sure they're, they're just, they're still right there on point. You know what I mean? So praise the Lord for that. <laughs> Let's see him, brother. <laughs> All right. Well, take your Bibles this morning we're going to the book of 2 Kings in the Word of God. 2 Kings chapter number 6 this morning. 2 Kings chapter number 6. Um, had the privilege of serving uh, not too far away, about an hour and a half away or so over in Exton, Pennsylvania as an assistant pastor for about five years after we graduated in 2015. And so we got to do a lot of things as an assistant pastor, you know, it's kind of one of those catch-all type of titles. You get to work with the music and work with the youth and, you know, put in new toilets. I'm, I'm telling you, you get to do all sorts of fun stuff. And we got, uh, we got some electrical skills and some plumbing skills and some things they don't teach you in Bible college, you know what I mean? Some good practical skills that way but one of the projects that we did was we uh, replaced some carpet uh, in the auditorium put in some new carpet and uh, well we had a company do it but we tore out the old carpet and so that was you know the demolition is always a lot more fun than the construction aspect of things so we were having a great time but and when you tear out carpet it's important to have a sharp knife you know I'm one of those people that likes to use things as long as you can use them and squeeze out every last ounce of usefulness out of them, you know. And uh, when you're serving Jesus, you know, unless you're, you know, one of them TV evangelists, which, you know, maybe someday, but <laughs> you're probably not making a whole ton of money. So you're just, you know, squeezing those pennies and squeezing those nickels until they bleed, you know what I mean? And, but when you're, when you're cutting carpet, it's important to have a sharp knife. And uh, I kind of found that out the hard way. You know, I was struggling and trying to make every one of those little exacto blades just last as long as I possibly could. And one of the guys finally said, you just, just, you need to get a new blade on that, Brother Drew. You're working way too hard. And so I put a new blade in that knife. And let me tell you, it was just like butter. It was just, it was a beautiful thing. And I learned that day just the importance of having a sharp knife in order to get some work done. And this morning, I want to talk to you for a few moments about getting back the cutting edge. Getting back the cutting edge. Cutting edge is kind of a term that's thrown out there for you know, anything that's new or innovative or you know, it's, it's right on the cutting edge. You know, it's a cutting edge technology or it's a cutting edge new method for doing whatever it might be. But today, I want to talk to us about getting back our cutting edge. And by cutting edge, I'm going to use that as an illustration this morning of the power of the Holy Spirit in the Christian life. The power of the Holy Spirit in the Christian life. I'm thankful this morning that as a Christian, you cannot lose the presence of the Holy Spirit. Once we're saved, we're always saved. God says, uh, you know, I give them to them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my Father's hand, Jesus said. Once we're saved, we're His eternally, and He puts His Holy Spirit inside of each and every one of us. And we don't, it's not something we have to have anxiety about or worry about. And once you believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Amen. And He'll never leave you nor forsake you. You're never alone. And that's one of the great aspects of the Christian life is we don't have to do it on our own. That Jesus is with us. Amen. But there can come a time in a Christian's life, although we cannot lose the presence of the Holy Spirit, that we can lose His power. And lose the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through our lives. And so by looking at the example that we're given here in 2 Kings chapter 6, I'd like to talk to you about getting back that cutting edge. Look with me in 2 Kings 6 and verse number 1. The Bible says, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold, now the place where we dwell is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam. And let us make a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither. And the iron did swim. And he said, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand 
and took it. He put out his hand and took it. Getting back the cutting edge. This was an exciting time here for the sons of the prophets under Elisha's ministry. It was an exciting time. The, the Bible tells us that the place they, had, they were at was too straight or was too small. They, it wasn't able to contain all that God was doing. There were evidently more and more being added to the school of the prophets, and, and there was no longer enough space to contain them all. And it's exciting to be where God's doing something. I look out and I'm excited to see so many of you out there today and see what God's doing right here in Kendall Park Baptist Church. And it's exciting to be somewhere where God is doing something. Amen. And they were here. I mean, they were, they, were, they were there and they were all about it and they were excited about what God was doing. And they, they said, we need to build. We need to expand. We need to make this place bigger. We need to go and, and put up a new building. And, and I'm, I don't have time to develop all of this, but man, it's exciting that, 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 that what God was doing there. And, and they were all getting their tools together and, and, and making preparations and making plans. And we see Elisha, the man of God, was right there with them. He wasn't sitting off to the sideline and saying, ah, oh, y'all you, go ahead, you know, I'll sit over here and drink my pink lemonade. No, he was right there in the middle of all of it, and I'm thankful that y'all have a pastor who I know was right there in the middle of it, and, and Brother Josh, who he's right there in the middle of it, and I'm telling you, everybody just working together to see God do great things. It's an exciting, exciting thing. And here they are, it was an exciting time. God was working, and they were getting ready to expand. They were getting ready to expand. And so, they're getting everything together. And these young men, they, they probably didn't have a whole lot by way of means. And, and you know, they were kind of living by faith and obeying God and seeing what God was going to do. And so, you know, the Bible tells us that this young man who lost his axe said it was a borrowed one. They were, no, they were probably going around to, to, to their, their parents or their friends or their neighbors and saying, Hey, God's doing something awesome. God's doing something amazing. <laughs> you got an axe that I can borrow? You got a hammer that I can borrow? I mean, we, we, we were here. We're getting it done. And we need some help. So number one this morning, as we consider getting back your cutting edge, I want you to see the loaning of the axe head. The loaning of the axe head. To this young man, this was not his own. Verse number five, at the end of the verse, it talks about how it was a borrowed axe head. Somebody cared enough about this young man, about this, this, uh, this, this, this young man here, to, to allow him to borrow their axe, to give it to him. They entrusted him with that vital tool. And he took it, and he was using it for right. But we see that it wasn't his. It was given to him. It was borrowed. And as I look at our lives, as I look at our Christian lives, it's important to realize and it's important to recognize the fact that all that we have is not ours. All that we accomplish is not because of us. All the tools and the talents and the abilities that God has given to us, they're in fact given to us from God. They're given to us from God. And they're his and they belong to him. Romans, 5, uh, Romans 8 and verse 32 reminds us, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him freely give us all things? I'm glad we serve a God that will freely give. That will freely give. James reminds us that every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variable, neither shadow of turning. James 1.17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And anything that we have, it's, it's not ours. It belongs to the King of kings and Lord of lords. I love the old hymn, Only a Sinner Saved by Grace. The first line of that hymn goes, Not have I gotten, but what I received. Grace hath bestowed it since I have believed. It all belongs to Him. But you see, I, I believe we live in a society that when something doesn't belong to us or doesn't belong to us personally, we don't treat it so well. You know, there's a, there's, there's, there's a problem with, with, with renters and people, you know, landlords who are trying to rent a property and, and, and somebody will come in and will live there and will just totally destroy the place because, ah, oh, it's not mine. Ah, oh, it doesn't belong to me. And we live in a society where people are, are owning less and less and, 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 and borrowing more and more, and yet there can be this attitude of, well, you know, it's not mine, so it's not my problem. You know, I don't own this house, so who cares if the, if the yard looks terrible? You know, it, it's, not my, it's not my problem. It's not my responsibility. But anything, realizing that everything that we get from God, there's a certain accountability there. Realizing that it's not ours, it is His, and we ought to take care of it, better care of it, than if it were ours in the first place. Everything that we get from God, we ought to take care of, but everything we get from God ought to be used in the way that He intended it to be used. It ought to be used. 
God didn't just give you your talents. He didn't just give you life and, and didn't just give you the, the ability to serve him just so you could sit around and hide your talent. Just so you could say, ah, you know, I'm just going to come to church and I'm just going to observe. I'm going to spectate. Church is not a spectator sport. This is not a place that we just come to sit around like, like an old sponge and just soak it all in and just sit there and, 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 and get all rotten and nasty. Now, a church is a place where we come to, 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 to take in, yes, but to give and to minister and to bless. And you ought to come to church, yes, with the expectation of what's God going to show me today? What, how's God going to speak to me today? But who can I bless today? Who can I encourage today? Who can I give a word today from the Lord? Because when we realize that I got nothing except for what he gave me, even my, my, my time, every second, every breath is a gift from God and ought to be used for his honor and for his glory. For these sons of the prophets, a new place was not just an unneeded perk. It was a necessity. It was something that God wanted them to do. And they were willing to, 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 to borrow and, and beg and whatever they had to do in order to get the tools to get the job done, the loaning of the axe head. Daniel Webster, a great statesman of yesteryear, was once asked this. Mr. Webster, what is the most sobering, searching thought that has ever entered your mind? And he replied this, my personal accountability to God. We owe it all to him. He asks us for so little in comparison to what he's given us. We see the loaning of the axe head. But number two, we see the losing of the axe head. The losing of the axe head. Verse number five. As one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. The losing of the axe head. I find it interesting that he lost his axe head as he was right there in the thick of it serving God. Now sometimes people can can lose their cutting edge because they get rusty. They're not being used. They're not, they're not, they're not out there doing the work. They're kind of sitting around, and, and, and then, you know, the, 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 if you leave some metal sitting out in the elements, it's going to get rusty, and it's going to get unusable. And surely we should, we should you know, strive to not allow that to happen, but to be filled with the Spirit of God and serving Him each and every day. But we see that this young man loses his accent in the middle of serving God. In the middle of the place of service, he loses his axe head. In fact, as we think about it in our own Christian lives, sometimes the busier that we are, the more likely we are to lose our cutting edge. The more likely we are to lose our axe head, if you will. And it's sad to say, but I think there's a lot today that's being done in the power of the flesh for the Lord. Oh, yes, we're trying to serve God. Oh, yes, we're trying to do what's right, but we're doing it in our own strength and not in the power of the Spirit. I mean, it's easy. I mean, it's easy to get busy and to, get, to, to, to just get all wrapped up in what are we doing for God? What are we doing for God? How are we doing this? And what are we doing over here? And we got this event coming up. We got revival meetings this week. And we got VBS coming up. And we got this event coming up. Oh, what do we, ah, that we can lose our cutting edge. And for this young man, I, I, I see that he lost it in the middle of service, but I believe that he lost it while he was diligent in his work, but I believe he also lost it because he was negligent in his watch. You see, if you ever use an ax before, an ax head doesn't just pff, come off out of nowhere. What will happen is, is, is you're swinging that ax and as you're, you're doing the work that the, 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 the head will become a little bit loose on the handle, kind of have a little bit of a wiggle to it. And once that happens, you know, it would be smart to kind of make sure that thing is, is, is shored up and make sure that thing's pushed back in there. But if you, if you keep swinging, it'll just get looser and looser and looser. And this is what happened to this young man. I mean, he was busy. He was busy. This is a bunch of young men. I think there's probably a little contest going on, you know. A little contest. Oh, I bet I could chop more wood than you. I mean, they were going in there. I'm, I'm, oh, well, watch this. Watch this. Wham, you know what I mean? And, and, and this young man, he's, I don't know, maybe he got distracted, maybe he got negligent in his watch, but he's swinging and he's swinging and he goes back with a mighty swing and that axe head comes off the handle. You know, I, I, I like to think with my sanctified imagination that everything went into slow motion at that point. No. You know? and, and, and there it goes, tumbling end over end and splash into the muddy waters of the Jordan River. He loses his cutting edge. Our Lord told his disciples, watch and pray 
lest ye enter into temptation. Mark 14 and verse 38. I believe that some of our spiritual breakdowns, if you will, can be traced back to neglect. Let me say it this way. Don't ever get so busy in the work of the Lord that you neglect the Lord of the work. That you neglect the Lord of the work. One of the saddest verses in the Bible, I believe, is Judges 16 and verse number 20. And Judges, in that passage, is talking about Samson. You all know Samson. Samson was a... A man that was mightily used of God, that was mightily blessed of God with extraordinary strength. And I believe that Samson lost his cutting edge somewhere along the way. Oh, he was was strong and he was, you know, tearing gates off of cities and carrying them. And he was taking the the jawbone of a donkey and killing a thousand Philistines. And ah, he was getting it done. But he started to neglect his Lord a little bit. And he started to, 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 to get into some things that he shouldn't. One of those things was a lady by the name of Delilah. And you think Samson would have seen it coming. She keeps asking him, oh, Samson, sweetheart, tell me the secret of your strength. Right, this woman's up to something. I'm getting out of here. But no, Samson was dumb. And he told her some lies at first. Oh, you know, if you, if you tie my hair into this loom, I'll be weak as any other man. And then she goes and does it. And says, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And Samson whoosh, rips his head out. Oh, where are they? Can't bring them to me. I think, Samson, she, she's trying to get you. Oh, if you tie me up with some new ropes, I'll be as weak as any other man. And she does it. Samson, the Philistines are upon you. Whoosh, where are they at? But in Judges 16 and verse 20, she finally had broken him down. And he told her the secret of, her strength, of, of his strength. Shave my head. I'll be as weak as any other man. She does it. It says, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. The Bible says he rose up and shook himself as other times to go out and defeat the Philistines. And he wist not that his strength had departed. He wist not that the spirit had departed from him. Didn't even realize it. The power of God was no longer in his life, that his great strength was gone. As Christians, if we're not careful, sometimes we can get busy for God. We can, we can be trying to serve God, trying to do what's right. And we don't even realize that we're doing it in our own strength. We're doing it in our own strength. In this Martha world, it's important that we take some time to be Mary, sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha had good intentions, man. Jesus is here, man. We gotta, we gotta, you know, we gotta dust everything, and we gotta make sure that the cake is ready, and we gotta make sure the dinner's ready, and this over here, and that over here, and, and, and she's she's running around, she's trying to get it done. But Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're troubled about many things, and, and you, you 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 missed you missed the point, Martha. Mary has chosen that good part. Sometimes we can get so busy, we can get so stressed out that we neglect to spend time sitting at his feet and getting recharged and rekindled and getting that cutting edge back. And let me tell you something. If you've lost your cutting edge this morning, don't try to work with just the handle. Don't try to work with just the handle. You ever try to cut down a tree with the handle of an ax before? Frustrating. You're going to be making a lot of noise, but not getting a whole lot done. And what's going to happen is not that the tree's going to fall over, but you'll probably break that axe handle. Because that's not what it was made to do. That axe handle was made to carry the axe head. The axe head is what does the work of chopping down the trees. But if we we keep trying to do it in our own strength, we keep trying to push through and just make it and and, and swing that handle. Ah, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm I'm, I'm pleasing God. You're either going to hurt yourself or you're going to hurt those that you're trying to help and hurt the ministry that you're trying to do. Don't try to just work with the handle. But number three, we see the locating of the axe head. The locating of the axe head. Verse number six. Bible says, and the man of God said, where fell it? And he showed him the place and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither and the iron did swim. When the cutting edge is gone and the power of the, to live the Christian life is gone, what is a believer to do? What are we to do? 
Sometimes the hardest thing for a backslider is to realize that, first of all, that they are backslidden. And then to figure out, well, well when did this all go wrong? When did we, how did we get to where we are now? How did we slide so far away from where we're supposed to be? How long has this been taking place? But let me tell you something. If you're attempting to live the Christian life, the supernatural life this morning in your own power, you're frustrated. You're worn out. You're getting discouraged. And it doesn't have to be that way. You can get your cutting edge back. If you're not experiencing the victory that the Lord purchased for you on that cross, and then he promised to you, you can find that again. But it comes when we're honest. Elisha says to the, to the young man, where fell it? I find that interesting. He said, where did, where did it fall? How did this happen? Where, where, take me to the spot where you lost your cutting edge. And I find that sometimes when we need to get our cutting edge back, that's exactly what we need to go, we need to do. Go back to where we lost it. Where was that place? When, 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 what, what decision was it? What started the drift? Go back to, there, to that place and you'll probably find that cutting edge that you've lost. I love 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus wants to get you back on the right track. He wants, Jesus, come here, come on, stop, stop. Put the handle down. Bring it over here. Let's, let's, let's get this axe head back on. Come here. Let's get, let's get this thing figured out. Whew. You'll always find the Lord exactly in the place where you left him. Go back. Go back. But not only does he say, where fell it? But then he says, the Bible says he cut down a stick and he cast it in the water. And I believe that that stick is a beautiful picture of the cross. If you've lost your cutting edge this morning, the best thing that you can do is, is kneel at the cross of your Savior and look up into the face of the one who loved you and died for you. Look up into the face of the one who defeated sin and defeated death and now offers you victory. Come back to the cross. Get it all right. Get whatever's, whatever's pulling you down, holding you back, get it right. And in the power of that cross, go forward. Power of that cross. Believe that stick there is a, sim a symbol of what our Savior did at Calvary. He throws the stick into the water. And look at what happens. The Bible says that the iron did swim. Now, I'm no scientist, but I know one thing for sure. Iron doesn't swim. It doesn't. It sinks down to the bottom of whatever body of water you throw it in. And this wasn't just a nice little crick. You know what I mean? Y'all have cricks around here? Nice little crick. This wasn't a nice little crick, okay? This was the raging Jordan River. One where, back in Israel's history, God had to part in order for them to get into the promised land. So not only is this, this, this iron fighting the laws of gravity and going up when it should be going down, but it's also fighting against the current of the Jordan that would seek to sweep it away. All that to say this, when the power of God is involved, miracles start to happen. Things that defy human reasoning and explanation begin to happen. And I don't know about you, but that's where I want to live. I don't want to just live in my own strength and my own power and everything that can be explained and rationalized. I want God to blow my mind. I can imagine that, that, that young man sitting there watching Elisha take a stick and throw it into the water. What in the world is that going to do? I mean, you've got to get a bit longer one if you're going to reach down there and scoop it up, Elijah. What are you, what are you doing? And then he watches that axe head bloop, 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 bob up to the surface. Whew. The locating of the axe head. I'm thankful for a God. I'm thankful for a cross that not only saves, but it sanctifies and it restores. If you want to continue to live powerless, barely making it by, not accomplishing a whole lot for God, then do nothing. Just keep on trying. Keep on swinging with that handle. But if you want God's power in its fullness, find where you lost that cutting edge, throw in that stick, and watch the miracle of restoration that God will do on your behalf. What a Savior. But then look at what he says in verse number 7. 
Therefore said he, take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. The choice is ours, folks. We got to reach out and we got to take it. God will do the work. He'll bring this, the iron up to the service. He'll do the restoration. But we got to reach out and we got to take it. It's not enough to just come to a revival meeting and allow God to work in your heart and say, man, I, yeah, I, I, need to, I need to do that. And yeah, I need to obey God in that area. That was, that was good. I'll think about that. <laughs> it's not going to do you any good. You got to reach out. You got to take that thing back. Jam it back on that handle. Make sure it ain't going to fall off again anytime soon and get back out there and keep on chopping wood for Jesus. <laughs> Don't try to do the, power, the, do the work of God in your own strength and in your own power. Take that time to renew yourself each and every day. It's got to be a daily thing. Each and every day, spending time at the feet of Jesus so that you can go out and do the work of Jesus. Once upon a time, there were two woodcutters. One's name was Peter and one's name was John. And they were often at odds about who chopped more wood. So one day they decided, maybe like these young men here in the passage, they decided they were going to have a contest. A simple contest, really. Eight hours, one work day. Who can chop the most wood? And so the rules were set. And both men grabbed their axe and made sure it was real sharp. And they got the judge there in place. They said, okay, at the end of the day, you're going to judge and see who was able to chop the most wood. Eight o'clock hit, and they both started working as fast as they could. Peter's over there on his side of the forest, and man, he's chopping wood, and he's chopping wood. And, and after about an hour goes by, he's, he's starting to kind of get a little weary, a little worn. He's like, I've been chopping wood as fast as I possibly can because I'm going to beat that boy, John. I'm not going to let him beat me. His arms are starting to get a little bit weary, but then he heard it. Over from the other side of the forest, John's axe stopped ringing out. Peter said, oh, I got him now. He, he doubled down, and he began working even faster. And for 15 minutes, there was no sound from over on John's side of the forest. He's like, ah, oh, he's already taking a 15-minute break. <laughs> I got him now. There's no way that he's going to beat me. And so he worked on for another hour, and again, he, he started getting a little bit weary, but then he heard it again, John's axe, stop. He said, oh, buddy, oh, buddy, I'm going to go up on him of a whole half hour's worth of work now. The same thing happened the whole day. Peter would keep on chopping, but John would stop for about 15 minutes every hour. At the end of the day, they had their two piles of wood there, and the judge came out, and they didn't even really need the judge. So as Peter looked over, John's stack of wood was taller than his was. He said, oh, wait, wait a minute, time out. I worked the entire day. I stopped maybe five minutes out of the entire day, and yet he has chopped more wood than I have. How in the world is this possible? So after the contest was over, he went over to John. Shoulders hung a little bit. I said, John, I just don't understand. How are you able to chop more wood? I heard you. Every, 15, every, every hour you took a 15-minute break, and I kept working. How in the world did you chop more wood than me? And John looked at him with a smile and said, Well, for those 15 minutes, I was sharpening my axe. Let me tell you something. We can get busy. We can get run around like a chicken with a head cut off trying to get it all done, trying to shove this thing in. And I'm telling you, we have more time-saving devices nowadays than we ever have in human history, but it seems like we're more busy. <laughs> it's information overload, it's just, it's just ah, it's too much. We can get so busy and so wrapped up in our schedule and our day-to-day -day grind and in trying to do what's right and even trying to serve God that we can lose our cutting edge. Don't neglect your time with Him each day. If you've lost your cutting edge a little bit this morning, maybe you need to go home. Before you take a nap, before you get on with the activities of the afternoon, and get renewed right here in this book. Get your axe sharpened again so that you can be effective in your ministry for Christ. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this, this, great, this great, great example from your word of getting back our cutting edge. Lord, oh, I pray that you'd help us to... If we've gotten away from spending time with you to just afresh and anew dedicate ourselves to sharpening our life.
to get and make sure that power of the Holy Spirit is governing our actions and not our own strength. And to spend in time with you each and every day so that we can be effective, Lord, and we can see much happen through your power and for your glory. Thank you so much, Lord. I pray you bless the rest of the week and speak to us each and every service. In Jesus' name I pray.